George Dana Boardman, pioneer missionary to Burma, born 1801, died 1831. Two goals in his life, number one, to know Christ, and number two, to reach the Burmese for Christ. Um, <clears throat> George um, was born um, in Livermore, Maine. He was a son of a Baptist preacher, and... Uh, <clears throat> As a young child, they moved to a city called North Yarmouth, Maine, and uh, was uh, growing up a very scholarly student, loved books, and um, uh, had a knack for governing unmanageable schools as a late teenager. Um, I'm going to th throw out an offer for him to join Join me in my children's ministry, right, Dave, Davey? I uh, need a little, uh, a little help. Brother Boardman, can you swing down to Fairhaven? Just 200 years too late. Uh, governing unmanageable schools. I tell people this. Best test for the ministry, get on a noisy bus. Get every person on the bus quiet and listening to you. It's... You might as well get practice now. I, I, can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. I thought I couldn't too. Mr. Wright put me on the Glen Park bus. We had <clears throat> a little bit more than what the state would allow uh, in those days on the bus. He said, you're by quiet. And I didn't make an announcement. You're by quiet. I, 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 I don't know. I don't know any of these. I don't know. I don't, get everybody quiet. Um... It took a little bit of time, but uh, probably one of the most uh, things I'm grateful for is that he made me do that. Because there's not any one of you that are going to go to work somewhere where a pastor's not going to say, can you please give us help on our children's ministry? What's the children's ministry like? Well, you know, there they are. <laughs> there they are. It's... it's uh, it, it takes a little bit out of you. It takes a little bit out of you. You have to come out of yourself a little bit. And you have to think, and you have to work, and you have to be patient. You have to keep at it. So I see a tremendous trait here. Um, <coughs> a, a man with the sincerity and the discipline and the uh, ability and the patience to govern unmanageable school. Well, in the uh, uh, age 19, he enrolls in Maine Theological Institute. Not named that today. Today it's called Colby College. In 18, um, early 1800s here, uh, the... Um, Commonwealth of Massachusetts adopted a petition to establish the Maine Literary and Theological Institution. This petition was led by Baptists who had come to the region for missionary work and wanted to train their own ministers. Well, <clears throat> soon afterwards here, um, I guess it was 1820, Maine separated from Massachusetts. Apparently Maine was a part of Massachusetts at that time. If my Maine history is wrong here, Haley, correct me at any point. Does that sound right? Okay, I'm safe. I can say whatever I want. Maine was filled as it is today with uh, natives that are wild and restless. They roam the rivers and the forests, attacking and eating visitors as cannibals. Uh, am I right there? I guess they separated from Massachusetts in 1820. And so the first main let the first uh, independent main legislature said that this college was going to have to make some uh, definite changes. One was no student could be uh, denied admission based on re uh, on religion, and or nor could the institution apply a religious test when selecting its board members. So within just a couple years. This institution 
Maine Theological Institute, founded by Baptists who wanted to train their uh, uh, ministers for this region, basically came under the control and the guidelines of the state government. And uh, it forced them to change uh, their, really their purpose. And it was renamed Waterville College as well. And it, it, it uh, did okay for a while, but it was in a serious decline in the mid to late uh, 1800s. Many of the, the students went to the Civil War and uh, the college today has a, has a monument to those students. Um, it was one of the first colleges to promote anti-slavery group on, on campus there in, in leading up to the Civil War. But uh, funds had dried up and enrollment was going down. Um, <clears throat> And so in, in 1865, at the end of the Civil War, a Boston merchant named Gardner Colby attended Waterville College's commencement and uh, surprised the college president by announcing that he had a $50,000 matching donation in order to keep the college open. And uh, so in honor of that and gratitude for that, uh, Maine Theological Institute which the state of Maine renamed Waterville College, which Colby's donation got it renamed Colby University, uh, uh, in which uh, it is today. And uh, so that's the progress there of the theological institute that uh, George Dana Boardman enrolled in there at the age of 19. <clears throat> um, he was saved and baptized uh, in 1820 at the age of 19 at the Waterville, Maine Baptist Church. And immediately he ex showed a zeal for witnessing, which he maintained until the time of his death. At the age of 21, he uh, dedicated his life for service to the Lord, whatever area that might be. The president of... Uh, Waterville College had his eyes on George Dana Boardman uh, to tag him to be the next president. So they wanted him to be professor uh, upon graduation. They offered him this, this position, uh, and then uh, he was uh, let know that, uh, stick with this, we have you in mind to be our next president. So he did instruct professor for one year. But during that year, he read of the death of a man by the name of James Coleman in Burma. And uh, he saw his obituary in a, a Boston newspaper. And he learned that James Coleman had given his life in service, mission field. Of course, he would have known of Adoniram Judson and his work there. But the thought hit him, who, who, can, who is going to replace James Coleman? He thought, many people could replace me here, but who'd be willing to go? And he said, I'm willing to go, and determined to go to Burma as a, a missionary. He then uh, left his uh, professorship and went down to Andover Seminary, and uh, there read books on missionaries and said some things like this in his diaries, send me wherever my services are most needed. And he, he also said this, it is the greatness of the work, not the trials, which trouble me most. So in 1823, he offered himself as a missions candidate at the uh, Triennial Convention. He was accepted uh, by the Baptist Mission Board. And uh, when he got his acceptance, he said this, there let me live, labor, and die. He immediately involved himself with... Uh, the studies of Greek and Hebrew, recognizing the importance that translation was going to be as a um, missionary. And uh, he joined a missions prayer band at Andover called the Society of Inquiring Respecting Missions. And uh, <clears throat> there they met and prayed. He had a desire for both himself and for the other young people 
to get a missions desire while they were in college because he said if someone can catch a zeal for missions while a college student, they would undoubtedly carry that with them through the rest of their life. Well, he was ordained uh, February 16th, 1825 um, in uh, North Yarmouth, Maine at the church which uh, his father formerly pastored. He had a very brief three-month deputation. Uh, <clears throat> he met a young lady named Sarah Hall from Salem, Massachusetts, and they were married. And the day after, they set off to catch their ship to sail to India. July 16, 1825. They sailed, they arrived in Calcutta in December. And in India, the Boardmans, Sarah Hall Boardman and George Dana Boardman, studied Burmese. Uh, the British Burmese War had just ended. <clears throat> we'll talk about that second half class today. And uh, so he ministers here briefly in, in Calcutta. And then, um, after just over a year, they arrived in Burma, Amherst, Burma, uh, where they met and saw Adoniram Judson. And their first thought when they saw him was that uh, Judson looked worn out with sufferings. No doubt, we'll, we'll, we'll give you a little glimpse into the specifics of Adoniram Judson's <clears throat> quote-unquote prison stay during the British-Burmese War. And uh, he's just gone through uh, maybe the most severe trial of his life, physically, mentally, and spiritually. And uh, that's the Judson that greeted them. It was George Boardman, one of his first tasks was to build the casket for Anne and Adoniram's uh, young daughter, Maria, two and a half years old, when she died. He goes to the area of Burma known as Mall Mine. It was his first work. It was a British settlement. And uh, the city, Mall Mine, was divided by a river. On one half of the river lived the British. On the other half lived the natives. Have you ever heard the statement, they come from the wrong side of the tracks? Or there's a divide uh, between two different uh, groups of people, and uh, they're glad to have it that way? And that was the situation that Boardman faced here. Uh, his house, the building where they worked at, was completely, totally wiped out by the natives. He responded with no regrets for that. Later in the year 1827, Judson actually joined the Boardmans in Mall Mine, and this became the center of American missions in Burma. And they were overjoyed that in October, near the end of the month, there was the first conversion, or first, sorry, first conversation with a Burmese Christian. The language was kicking in. Uh, soon, Boardman began a boys' school, and his wife began a girls' school. Sarah Boardman. Uh, we'll talk about her in a little bit. Um, they spent time... To, uh, they, 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 uh, the Boardmans themselves moved to a town called Tavoy. It's well described if you've downloaded or uh, have a copy of the, the book, The Three Judsons. The book Tavoy is in, in detail described what they were seeing, what the culture was, what the, the dress and such was like, what the attitude of the people uh, was. But the town summary was an, filled with idolatrous shrines, uh, hundreds of pagodas, uh, Buddha temples, uh, a forest surrounding Tavoy contained the vicious, uncivilized tribe known as the Karens, who were foreigners even to the Burmese people. That's how uh, uncivilized that they were. No written language, many dialects, lived in animal-filled <coughs> jungles, no record of their origin, no religion, they worshipped no supreme being, uh, they were simply referred to as the wild men. Boardman 
diligently worked to reduce their language to uh, writing and communicated to them the gospel. In 1828, in December, Boardman began to be afflicted with what we would probably call tuberculosis. Uh, a little more descriptively, would be a bloody discharge of the lungs through the throat. He was sick with this till his death. Problems that he faced here. The variety of dialect among the people God called him to. Zero moral principles at all. No moral foundation whatsoever. Discouragement. And the fact that some seemed promising those that did listen, but then returned back to their idolatrous way. In fact, three of the four most promising um, uh, prospects that they had turned back to gross immorality. Then his daughter died, Sarah. Then his son died. Then his wife, Sarah, was laid at the point of death for weeks and recovered somewhat. And then again, the natives revolted against the British and the boardmans lost all. They lost all because the revolters overtook and used the boardman's house as a barracks for their... Uh, warfare they were fighting. But in time, even this ministry began to reap. They, they began to see conversions. They began to see regular baptisms. In fact, in 1830, over 30 converts were baptized, which caused the boardmen to plead for more laborers, to plead for the need. All the time, tuberculosis is uh, sapping him of his, uh, of his energy. In February 1830, George Boardman sent a farewell letter to relatives. And it, the letter included two regrets. One is the burden that his death was going to put on his uh, family, particularly on his wife. And the second regret that he expressed in this letter was the fact that the natives around him were dying regularly and needed to hear the gospel. In January 1831, the missionary family, the Masons, arrived to assist, and uh, their first um, observation was that they saw death in the countenance of George Boardman. And it was on February 11th, 1831, that he died. Just before he died, by his request, there was going to be a baptismal service. It was a rainy day, but uh, George Borbman insisted, and so um, several men put him on a cot and carried him down to the place of the baptism. And there... Uh, as he lay dying, he watched with great joy as 34 new converts were baptized. And they uh, <coughs> sought to return him back home, uh, but he died. He died en route. All told, over 70 of the Karen <coughs> tribe came to Christ uh, through the time of his labor. And in summary, we'll mention four things that dominate the life of George Dana Boardman. Number one was a pursuit of the knowledge of Christ. This shows up through his correspondence that's been saved, pursuit of the knowledge of Christ. Number two is patient endurance and suffering. Patient endurance through these sufferings. Number three is his prayer life. And number four was his sense of unworthiness.
It's as though every year that his ministry grew, his humility increased. His sense of his own unworthiness increased the more that uh, God blessed his work. So George Dana Boardman, a young man when he died, just uh, but uh, about 30 years old.